Do you remember when you were a kid how you could count on having to write an essay called What I Did on My Summer Vacation When You Got Back to School? Well, I just got back from my summer vacation, and at first this is going to sound a little like those grade school essays. But hang in there, it does turn into a sermon. <laughs> Two and a half weeks ago, I flew into Cincinnati to meet my wife, Linda, who had already begun a very long road trip. Over the next 17 days or so, we put well over 4,000 miles on the car as we traveled through Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, and Vermont. We saw old friends, spent time with lots of family, met up with a few parishioners, we went to a couple of movies, one of which I recommend, The Hundred Foot Journey. The other, well, let's just say it gets complicated when four very different people try to choose a movie. I read three great books. We attended a very fine rock concert did a lot of swimming, rode the alpine slide down a 3,000-foot mountain, toured a brewery and the back stretch at Saratoga Racetrack. Okay, I know, that doesn't sound so good. What did your pastor do on his vacation? He went to the track and had some beer. <laughs> but hey, my granddaughter rides and wanted to see the horses. I didn't place any bets. And before that, I was in Milwaukee. What else is there to do in Milwaukee but tour a brewery? The furthest point on our journey was Marquette, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula. My brother Bob and his wife Carol lived there. And while we were there, we went on a great boat trip on Lake Superior. When I was a boy, I remember being asked once in second grade if I could name the five Great Lakes. The only big lake I knew as a kid was Lake Champlain. And that was pretty great as far as I was concerned. But it wasn't an answer to the question. The five, in case you don't remember, are Erie, Ontario, Michigan, Huron, and then the big one, Gitche a Lake Superior. I learned a lot about it on that boat trip, including the fact that it's 1,332 feet deep at its deepest point, 160 miles wide at its widest, and that it stretches for a length that reaches out to 350 miles along the Canadian border. It's about the size of South Carolina. And it holds enough water to cover all of North and South America one foot deep. It's well known as a major shipping lane and huge ships filled with iron ore, copper, and a variety of other resources ply its waters. It's also known to be very dangerous at times with waves that rival the ocean. Many a ship has been wrecked trying to navigate it. Indeed, it's believed that there are over 550 wrecks scattered along its bottom. It is so cold that it is said Lake Superior seldom gives up it's dead. Many a loss has been suffered by sailors on Lake Superior. Peter was a sailor of sorts, a fisherman. And like those sailors on Lake Superior, he knew how frightening it could be to face the uncertainty 
of life. After all, the Galilee is also known for its sudden storms. So when Jesus starts talking about taking the risk of heading into Jerusalem, where he will face the very real possibility of being arrested and even executed, Peter, who knows what it means to face death, Peter protests. God forbid it, says the chief apostle. This must never happen to you. You would think Jesus would have been touched by Peter's concern. You would think he'd have thanked him for his loyalty, for his devotion. But he doesn't. In fact, Jesus lashes out at the big fisherman. He even resorts to name-calling. Get behind me, Satan! Poor Peter. He must have been stunned. You're trying to tempt me, says Jesus. This speaking the truth and facing certain death is tough enough without you trying to give me some wiggle room. Get behind me. And then he explains. Peter and the others may not have understood But Jesus lays it out very clearly. If you want to follow me, if you want to be one of my disciples, you have to be willing to take up your cross. You have to be willing to give up life itself in order to be saved. No doubt the apostles imagined literal crosses. After all, the Romans had littered the Judean countryside with them. Step a bit out of line, and the occupiers made sure you were strung up and hung out to dry. An example, a warning. Don't mess with Rome, or this might happen to you as well. And with the exception of John, such grim deaths did await all of those original followers. Peter himself would be hung on a literal cross upside down, so modest that he didn't want to be crucified in the same exact way that his master had been. And sometimes when we are willing to follow Jesus' way of peace and justice, sometimes that is exactly what happens to us as well. History is full of names of those martyred for speaking the truth. Men and women who literally gave up their lives for the cause of righteousness. But sometimes, perhaps even most times, giving up one's life means something far less literal, but nonetheless difficult. For what Jesus is saying here is that you must be willing to give up whatever stands in the way of your fully embracing the way of peace, the way of truth, the way of love. If you want to gain life, not just eternal life, but real life in the here and now, if you want to gain life, you must be willing to give up those things that preoccupy you and give you a false sense of security. It may feel like taking a real risk, 
but you can't take up the cross if your hands are already full. My brother Bob's youngest son, Mike, isn't afraid of taking risks. He and his wife, Lindsay, live in a house largely built with their own hands in the middle of the woods in northern Michigan. They're off the grid, generating their own power and heating with wood. They even have an outside facility. Lindsay works at a hospital 45 minutes from home as an aide, and Mike's cobs together various money makers ranging from cutting timber to gathering and selling scrap metal. You'd think that would be enough primitive living for anybody, but not for Mike and Lindsay, for their favorite pastimes include kayaking and tent camping. They've been known to pitch a tent even in the middle of winter. And their kayaking adventures not only take them along the shores of Lake Michigan, where they live, but also along the Upper Peninsula in the waters of Lake Superior. Lindsay was in her early 20s when she met Mike. She'd never been kayaking, as far as I know, and it was Mike who taught her the basics, different strokes, how to navigate, how to right her craft if she went upside down. Above all else, he warned her, never let go of your paddle, no matter what happens, never let go. Lindsay was a good student, and soon they were navigating more and more challenging waters. One weekend, they decided to travel to Moosening in the UP and kayak around Grand Island, a 12-mile island in Lake Superior. When they started out in the bay, the waters were fairly quiet and the going was smooth. But then they decided to paddle out to the part of the island that faced directly into the open waters. Suddenly, a storm came up, as they're wont to do on Superior, and Mike and Lindsay found themselves in the midst of huge waves and frightening winds. They got separated, and Mike's kayak crashed against the island's rocks, totally broken up. And Lindsay, Lindsay kept drifting further and further away into the lake. It was frightening for Lindsay as she wrestled her craft. It was frightening for Mike as he watched helplessly while his wife drifted away. Fortunately, Lindsay had a radio and was able to contact the National Lakeshore Rangers. Soon, not one, but Two boats found her, but the waves were very rough, and as they circled her, though they slowed down as much as they could, their wake made those waves even rougher. They got close enough to pull her aboard, but they needed her help. They needed to be able to grab her by the hands and arms and pull her aboard. Let go of the paddle, ma'am. Let go so we can pull you in. But Lindsay just clung to her paddle. Mike had said, never let it go. In great fear, she clung to it for dear life. Yet it was the very thing preventing her from being rescued. So what is it that you are clinging to for security?
What is it that you're holding on to for dear life? What is it that you are unwilling to give up? What of your life must you lose in order to be able to grab hold of the one who holds out eternal hands to rescue you from meaningless despair. Your image, a harmful relationship, Materialistic goals, an addiction. What do you need to lose in order to gain life, real life, full life? Those who lose their life for my sake, says Jesus will find it. Lindsay finally, finally took the risk and let go of the paddle and was pulled aboard and lived to tell me and others the tale. So what risk do you need to take? What's your paddle? Amen. Sisters and brothers, as we took that boat trip on Lake Superior, we were on a very large vessel for cruising and seeing the pictured rocks. Beautiful, beautiful spot. It was a gorgeous day, and there were many, many kayakers out. Tiny little kayakers compared to our, our large ship. Tiny little kayakers. The good news is this, God doesn't just care about those on the big ship. He cares about each one of us as we make our way through the waters of life in our kayaks. And God, in God's mercy, will even reach down and very gently ply our fingers away from the paddle until we're able to let it go. Might you find the courage, the strength, the wisdom to let go of whatever paddle is holding you back from being rescued.